Welcome to the podcast, Alan Aragon. It's time to sign in. Do you know your astrological sign? Uh, okay, okay. Um, I think I'm... Oh, gosh, this is terrible. Okay, I was born on January 1st, so that must You're make a me a Capricorn. Capricorn right? We love it. It's a Capricorn, like, week. <laughs> it is such an honor to be sitting here with you. Thank you so much, Olivia. I'm so happy to have made it here, took a little <laughs> jog around the block. Yeah. Uh, Super thrilled to be here. You are just such an OG in the nutrition and fitness and science world. And I really look up to you as a voice of reason and nuance and as a recovering extremist in the wellness world who's done everything from a raw vegan diet to the carnivore diet to, you know, fasting, water fasting, this and that. And finally realized, oh, my goodness, balance is the only thing that's sustainable. Your work really speaks to me. So I'm excited to have a nuanced conversation. Oh, that... It's so awesome to hear that. You know, I was just speaking with somebody the other day who was saying that, hey, Alan, your your voice has been strong in this industry for so long and you don't seem to be slowing down. And, and I'm like, well, I found what I love to do. Yeah. You know, you don't slow down when you love exactly. what you do. So, yeah. So here we are. I also follow your wife and she looks amazing she is my inspiration her shoulders her arms she's so strong she's smiling through her workouts like it's she's such an inspiration and the way that she's training that's her parents right that's her parents she's she was training them uh when i left the house this morning so and how old are they uh early 80s early 80s and, wow and um my mother-in-law is late 70s supposedly Okay. Yeah. Like okay. She could be in her, her early 80s. Supposedly. And, and they did like, like a little a modification with the, the old birth certificate there. Ah, uh, I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a question about that. Did they start weight training for the first time in their 80s? Yeah, that's right. They they just started a mm, year and a half ago. And how quickly did they progress? Like how much are they squatting right now? <laughs> I want to say, you know, I want to say the progression really market differences happened in three to six months mm. and then at the year point it was really spectacular yeah. so yeah it, it kind of went viral the whole um jenna training her parents thing yeah and it's it's pretty incredible it helped and inspired a lot of people so i'm super happy about that it's so motivating i mean i see her parents literally just doing like rows on the bench and i'm like oh i can totally get my my button to the gym today like oh, yeah. we're going <laughs> oh yeah yeah they, we got shots of uh, my father-in-law doing the the brett Contreras t bell stuff with the you just stacking the plates on there and yeah it's, it's, it's really cool it just comes to show that people generally harbor a stigma towards lifting yes when gosh you know that's what we're essentially meant to do so yeah oh yeah in an evolutionary sense we'd be lifting a whole lot of rocks and stones mm -hmm. and heavy animals and all of these things so yes. um yeah lifting is really the key and it's your advice around lifting and nutrition and having a balanced and flexible diet but still adhering to um you know the scientific parameters like a high protein diet that we know work and protect us as we age mm -hmm. It's just such a, a nice um, thing to hear because it's not sensationalized and it's not here's this new diet that's going to fix everything or here's this new workout program that's going to help you lose belly fat. It's, hey, you just got to put in the work a little bit each and every day and stick to something that works for you. And it's not sexy, but it, it, it works. Yep. You know, you got, you got to work the work. Just the boring everyday stuff. Yeah. The boring everyday stuff. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's what mm -hmm. we're about on this podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's start it off with, is there such a thing as an ideal diet for humankind? Yes, there is. But the um, but there's a lot of room for um, variability within that ideal. So the ideal kind of like the overarching part is eat enough calories, but don't go over that amount and don't eat too few calories, mm -hmm. you know? So there's this big push for eat less, eat less, eat less, eat less. Well, we don't see people doing t too well on the philosophy of low balling it through your whole life. Mm. Um, and that's from both a body composition standpoint as well as a, a clinical standpoint. So eat enough, fuel, eat enough to fuel your quality of life which includes your training quality, um, your body composition goals, you know, just, just fuel your physical activity and also, um, eat to enjoy what you eat to have fun. 
Yeah. And so when you strike a balance with all those things, then you kind of come upon the ideal diet. Now, composition wise is where there's a lot of variation. So um, one of the less negotiables, at least among the general public, is that we should be eating a diet that's mostly whole and minimally refined foods. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions within there, which are protein food products, because even though they're hella processed and, and highly engineered, uh, they consistently have favorable health effects. That's not really the case with carbohydrates when they're highly processed. <laughs> One could argue that an Oreo has favorable health effects if you have it once in a while and it makes you really happy, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> Psychologically, yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but definitely. with balance, right? Definitely. Yeah. And that's part of the, uh, the, in quotes, discretionary calorie allotment. The 10 to 20% of the diet that are essentially YOLO foods mm -hmm. or the fun foods or the indulgence foods where you can pretty much have whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And then the other 80 to 90% of the diet coming from whole and minimally refined foods, um, minimally processed foods, then that is pretty much the ideal human diet. Mm -hmm. And here's where the variation comes in. So once you've established getting sufficient protein, mm -hmm. which for most people, let's say, well, I guess we can get into that. Topic, yeah, right? we will. I got okay, so sufficient protein. And then where the variation really comes in is carbohydrate and fat proportion. Mm -hmm. So some people will do just fine and maybe even prefer and maybe even thrive much better on a high carb, low fat diet. Great. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine for the individual. Yep. And there's all the way on the other end of the continuum where somebody might prefer a high fat, low carb or high fat, very low carb ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly fine. So that's where really the variation comes in. But the ideal human diet, enough calories, enough protein, mostly whole and minimally refined foods. Okay. So you want to look at protein first. You want to make sure that you're eating enough protein first in the grand scheme of each meal as well as you know your entire daily intake and then the rest of it you can kind of play around mm -hmm. with yes keeping in mind that you'd want to mostly be getting the the fat or the carbs that you're playing with from whole foods you know avocado olive oil you know unprocessed meats things like that mm -hmm. That's right. um and then the rest you can kind of just be like all right the 10 percent i'm gonna have a cookie at night great yes as long as it fits into my greater daily intake that's right how would one even know where to start in terms of eating enough? Because I think this mm -hmm. is a big thing that comes up as I've shared my own journey um, with weight loss and reversing insulin resistance. I worked with a nutritionist who was able to, with trial and error, kind of finagle and figure out my maintenance calories, which yeah. were yeah. lower than I thought because I didn't have a lot of muscle mass. And so mm -hmm. we've had to mm -hmm. kind of bring that up, which I want to talk about too. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people have asked me, I, I'm not working with a trainer or a nutritionist right now. How the heck can I figure out my maintenance calories? Yeah, there's a difficult way, sort of a tedious way, but it's potentially more accurate way. Yeah. Then there's hypothetical ways to do it. So we'll, yeah. I'll go over the first one. So the tedious way would be to vow to not change your dietary habits and physical activity habits just vow to continue the rest of your life as it has been going yeah for another week yeah don't change a thing and just write everything down that you eat and drink for the week and then you average those values yeah and then you come up with you know your daily average for for calories and if you have been the same weight for at least a few months mm -hmm. then that is quite likely your maintenance caloric requirement mm -hmm. So that's kind of a pain to do. <laughs> it's also highly inaccurate due to human error because who has eyeballs that can figure out that that's 4.5 ounces of steak, yeah, you know? Right, right. There's that issue too. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's one way to do it. Yeah. Um, the other way is going the hypothetical way where you estimate your resting metabolic rate. Mm. And so um, kind of a quick and dirty way to do that if your normal weight is to just multiply your total body weight in pounds times 10. Okay. And then that's your resting metabolic rate. However, if you're overweight, you're going to end up overestimating that. So in that case, you could multiply your lean body mass by like 11 or 12, and you'll be in the ballpark okay. of what your resting metabolic rate is. Okay. Okay. So now once you've got your resting metabolic rate, so let's say for 
if it's we're talking about a 150 pound person if their rmr is 1500 calories then we've got to stack on to that what their activity level adds to their maintenance energy requirements mm -hmm. and that's another sort of um guesstimate that mm -hmm. you can dive into and usually people at the low end low activity you multiply that rmr by 1.2 you got a competitive athlete, it can be as high as like 2.2, 2.4. Okay. But for most um, people who are moderately active, you're looking at somewhere between 1.4 to 1.5-ish, mm -hmm. 1.6. Yeah. <laughs> so like anywhere from, I want to say 1.3 to 1.7 is where most people are going to be around that yeah. they would multiply their resting metabolic rate with. And depending on, really, depending on how much training volume you're doing, how much non-exercise activities involved with your lifestyle, whether you're somebody who sits around all day at work and then sits around all day at night when you get home, or with, whether you're somebody who is just on your feet all yeah. day. Mm -hmm. And then all night, you you know, you're active as well. So you're cleaning the house. You can't sit down, can't sit still. Yeah. That really can. matters, right? That's, that's yeah. you said non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Mm -hmm. So that's called NEAT, right? That's right. And, and how much does that play into our calories in, calories out equation? Oh, boy, it can make the difference between mm, just sort of, you know, in, in absolute numbers, like on the low end, like 250 calories uh, to the high end, uh, seven, 800 calories mm -hmm. between individuals. Yeah. And there's even research showing a thousand calorie difference in non-exercise activity uh, between individuals of the same body size, just because of how different their lifestyles are in terms yeah. of how much they move. Yep. So... And that includes like even things like fidgeting, right? It's yes. Just, even down mm -hmm. to how much you naturally kind of fidget, move around, pace around your house, pace oh, when yeah. you're on the phone, all of those little things add up. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think kind of play into this idea that we have of, oh, it's not fair. That person's metabolism is so much faster than mine. Yes. But really, they're probably fidgeting and moving and, and not sitting down and doing a lot of errands and their mind and their body are really busy. Whereas you might prefer getting home and watching some Netflix. Yeah. The NEAT factor or non-exercise activity thermogenesis factor is kind of like the this X factor that's hard to – it's hard to account for. Yeah. Because um, – and that's usually where people sort of mess up their um, estimated energy requirements. Yeah. Because it's easy enough to take your resting metabolic rate and multiply it by like let's say an average 1.4. Mm -hmm. Okay. Average amount of um, you know caloric need for the moderately active person. Okay, fine. But what if you have a very low neat level or what if you have a very high neat level? You have to kind of so variable account for those things. Yeah. And, and that's where kind of the trial and error comes in. So you estimate what might be your maintenance calories mm -hmm. and then you basically decide what what goal you want to target. You yeah. know, are you trying to lose weight? Or are you trying to gain weight? And yeah. um, or are you trying to just maintain and then you just w work it from there and then you run that self experiment for at least four weeks, and then you reassess yep. for where you need to go. So so with any given uh, program, there really is only potentially a month's worth of fumbling around. Yeah, it's going <laughs> to take dark, a little time. Yeah. In the dark before you know how to adjust the program. Yes. Once you run a trial for a month, you have an idea. Is this working? Is it not working? How is it working? Yeah. And what, what do we need to change, if anything? So there's, al there's always hope for program adjustment. Yeah. What would you say to an individual, especially a woman, who is like, okay, I, I did this calculation, I took these averages, I, I multiplied my weight, I took into account my activity, and I came up with this number that, let's say, is like 1,900 or 2,000 calories, and when I eat that, I gain weight. And I hear a lot of women tell me, I can't lose weight unless I eat 1,200 calories or less. Mm -hmm. And even for myself, when I did originally start working with my uh, nutritionist and trainer, we were kind of surprised at how... At how little I had to eat in the beginning to actually see any sort of movement on the scale. You know, I thought I would be somewhere like 18 or 1900 and it was more like 14 or 1500. Yeah. Um, and so is that, since that's so far off from what my actual like weight and activity told me I should be eating, mm -hmm. could like, what are the possible factors that could cause someone to need that little fuel and, and have, you know, not see any change from that? There are different things that can go on with, um, with water retention. Mm. Um, there are, well, there's the always, the old reliable misestimation yep. of caloric intake. Yeah. Um, what you can do if you're just sort of really wanting to find out whether you're misestimating 
or not. Yeah. Is you can just (laughs) corner yourself into having pre-packaged stuff. Well, I actually just weighed out my food. I, like I wouldn't cook. I would just like bake chicken breasts with it. like a tablespoon of oil for the whole batch. Weigh it out. I would. I was mm. meticulous mm. with my food, mm-hmm. and I was surprised at how little I had to eat. Yeah. So yeah. I guess more so, what I'm asking is like, is metabolic adaptation a thing? Because mm-hmm. could it be because I under ate when I was younger and had a history of that? Could it be because I was really low in muscle mass and really insulin resistant? Could it be a thyroid thing? Because I feel like this is so common for women. When you exhaust all the other possibilities, yeah, then you figure, okay, I might need to get a blood test. Yeah. Because um, there are certain scenarios that are outside of just normal healthy physiology. Mm-hmm. And we have to give that its, its credit. You know, we can't just figure, okay, everybody is going to fit into these formulas that we concoct or these, you know, these estimates that are supposed to be dead on the money. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would default to... Any of those things kind of and like digging into your blood to look at them. Yeah, but for maybe not for you, but for the general public, there is a lot of misestimation. There's a lot of variation in non-exercise activity. When people are dieting for so long, they're they're physiologically depressed. They're uh, they're sometimes they're psychologically depressed. Yeah. And they're just kind of lying around outside of their time that they're working out. They're just literally lethargic. And their neat is minimal. Yeah. And so when somebody is skating real low on low calories, like lower than what you would estimate, then one of the potential tactics is to increase the calories that they take in Mm -hmm. gently. You know, don't throw like 4,000 calories at somebody who theoretically needs to. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But when you add calories, then the kind of the agreement is, all right, we're going to add calories that is going to fuel greater non-exercise activity, greater spontaneous movement, and greater training output. And then we add all those together, and then we can kind of wake up yes. <laughs> the progress. So so that is an option that I've seen explored a lot more mm-hmm. in the space with a, a lot of people having success with it. Yeah. And this is one of those things that we didn't necessarily consider doing like 10, 15, 20 years ago. It was Last thing you wanted eat to do was add calories. More. Exactly. Yeah. It was okay, eat this less. Person's move more. not losing weight. Okay, maybe we just <laughs> eat even less. Yeah. And so mm, there, that ends up being a dead end. Yeah. So add calories, fuel greater um, energy output, and then end up raising the so called energy flux. Yes. And that's essentially what I did end up doing. Um, I, I upped my calories slowly. I did a kind of reverse dieting with my nutritionist mm-hmm. and she was like, we're, we're going to do this, but you're also going to have to train really hard and Good. be active and walk and like just walk around all day long. So I started to take my calls and my meetings while I was walking to get more, not that's not neat, but just to get more activity throughout my day. Mm-hmm. Um, and just kind of was like, all right, I just got to be a little more active around the house. Uh, you know, just kind of like put things away, organize a little bit more. I just got more activity wherever I could. And I started to train really hard to failure, which made a huge difference. And I had more energy to do that because I upped my calories and specifically my carbs. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was also after I I initially had dieted a bit and lost some weight at that lower calorie number and was able to reverse some of that insulin resistance and, and handle more carbohydrates. So it was a very specific tailored plan Um, but ultimately I started to understand what people are saying now when they say you might actually be under eating and that's Mm -hmm. why you can't lose weight. They don't mean that you're under eating and calories in calories out doesn't make sense. There is a law of thermodynamics. They just mean you're under eating for how much activity it's going to take for you to move enough and train hard enough to achieve the body composition you want and, and look better physically. That's right. Better fuel use, um, better partitioning. Yeah of calories into the lean tissue versus the fat tissue. Yes. Better, uh, higher mitochondrial activity, like within the muscle at the cellular Absolutely. level, all these really great adaptations that come with greater training capacity. Yeah. And so you need to fuel that somehow. Yes. Yep. And that's my absolute motivation for when I eat. I'm like, this is going to fuel my training today. I'm going to go hard. And it's that's been such mm-hmm. a nice mindset shift versus okay, like how I know I'm going to gain weight if I eat too much. How little can I eat in this meal? It's totally different. It's a dead end. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, Okay. So uh, 
for me, in terms of the maintenance calories and whatnot, how I got to that calculation, I actually had followed Dr. Lyon's advice that she had on with Dr. Um, Donald Lehman, mm -hmm. where they said, instead of doing the two methods that you said, which work for a lot of people, mm -hmm. if you're at that um, point where you're really stuck and still can't figure it out, just pick a number, whether it's 1600 or 1800, eat there, you know, weighing everything out, be really precise, eat yeah. there for a week, and then just see what happens to your weight. So that's kind of what I did. That's another way to do it. Yeah. yeah. I just ate at 1600 for a week and was like, what does the scale say? And I also weighed myself every day and took the average instead of just being like, here's where I started on Monday and here's where I was the mm -hmm. next Monday. Yep. Because it's so variable. So do you recommend that people do that, weigh themselves each day? Yeah, definitely. And that's why I really stress the idea of reassessing what's going on at the four week point. Mm hmm at the same point in um, relative to the menstrual cycle because ah. the water water fluctuations thereof can be significant. Yes. Yeah. I, I have actually said that before. I've said um, I get like one week a month to really see my progress from the last month. Yeah. And the rest of the month, I just have to keep working the program and just doing what I got to do and essentially, you know, know that it's going to pay off. But I'm not going to really see it until that week where I, I know that I'm leanest and I'm, I'm drier and I'm not holding as much water. And that's when I get to like rejoice in my results. But the rest of the time, I just have to trust the process. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good mindset shift because I think women can get so, um, you know, thrown off by these, these cycle shifts and water retention, especially if there is a hormone imbalance or there's a cortisol issue or PCOS, you can look so different week to week and you can get really discouraged. But Things are working. You just mm -hmm. got to wait until you're at the same place. That's right. Um, okay. So uh, we covered a little bit of what flexible dieting is, right? You mentioned that it's 80 to 90% whole mm -hmm. unprocessed foods, 10 to 20% processed. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of tell us why flexible dieting is important, especially for those who want to embark on perhaps a fat loss or body recomposition mm -hmm. journey and know that the bodybuilder chicken, rice, and broccoli life is not for them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so at its core, flexible dieting is individualizing the program to the person's personal preferences and their goals and their tolerances. And so that's really what flexible dieting is. And so um, you can't put everybody on keto mm. and expect them to succeed. You can't put everybody on high carb, low fat and say, hey, this is the diet for you and then expect them to succeed. And uh, so you, you have to individualize that, what, like what we talked about, the carb-fat proportion, proportion. And the other thing that you have to individualize is the linearity or the non-linearity of your caloric intake through the course of a given week. So if somebody has a goal of losing weight or losing body fat, mm -hmm. there, there's many options to do it, and that should be individualized. Some people like daily caloric restriction. Yeah. Some people are totally fine with um, being a little, bo a little more micromanagey with what they're taking in and what it's going to amount to every day. Yeah. Whereas other people, that would drive them a little crazy. And so therefore, they can employ tactics that allow for unrestricted eating during feeding phases like the intermittent fasting variants. Mm -hmm. You know, we got two main ones that, that are used. We got time restricted feeding mm -hmm. and then we have um, whole day fasting, whether it's uh, twice a week or, you know, like every other day, heaven forbid. Whoa, <laughs> people do that. Yeah. Heaven forbid. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, that's probably not ideal, but there's yeah. the so-called five, two plan. Okay. Um, where you eat at, without restriction, ad libitum for five days, and then you don't eat for two days of the week. And that has a surprisingly consistent positive um, result in, in the literature mm -hmm. uh, for general population purposes. I mean, we're talking about people who have no clue what they're doing and they just kind of have this yeah. vague idea that I need to eat less by the end of the day or the end of the week and this is how I'm going to try to do it. Yeah, they're not picking up a food scale or logging into my fitness pal. No. They're just like, if I just no. don't eat for two days, I probably am going to eat less calories overall in the whole week. That's right. They, yeah. They're not thinking about muscle protein synthesis. Mm -mm. You know. <laughs> yes, which I, I also want to talk about because when you're saying that this has benefit in the literature for the general population, you're mm -hmm. saying it has benefit in terms of just a, a weight loss perspective, not necessarily in terms of some magical benefit of intermittent fasting that you can't get otherwise, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. Let's just go right into that because okay. a lot of people ask me about intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. I personally am not a huge fan. I don't feel like 
women do their best with intermittent fasting, but that's also very anecdotal and not scientific for the mm. most part. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I do think a lot of the studies on intermittent fasting are done on men. So I feel like we perhaps need to dig a little bit more into women. But essentially my question for you is, is intermittent fasting this magical kind of prescription for either weight loss or insulin resistance or even longevity in terms of um, autophagy? Or is it simply working for people because it's just a way to reduce our total energy intake and is helping us to lose weight? Okay, so things you mentioned, um, in improving insulin resistance, improving longevity, um, you know, other fringe things, let's say, um, like in increasing autophagy. Yeah, fringe, I like it. All of those things happen when you lose body fat. Thank you. <laughs> All of those things. <laughs> so... Um, there was a recent uh, narrative review that I did. I, I, I was the lead author. I co-wrote it with my friend and colleague, Brad Schoenfeld, um, who everybody should know that his nickname is Saint Schoenfeld. <laughs> um, and I will send him probably this exact clip just to troll him. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, we did this review of the literature on intermittent fasting as it affects body composition. Mm. And... Lo and behold, intermittent fasting, whether you do a time-restricted feeding variant where you limit your feeding window to, oh, anywhere from on the low end, four or five hours to the high end, eight-ish, nine-ish hours a day within a single day, the time-restricted feeding model, or whether it's the uh, twice-a-week fasting or every other day fasting model, all of that stuff uh, in aggregate is on par with daily caloric restriction in terms of its effectiveness for weight loss and fat loss. Mm -hmm. When you start going into every other day fasting zero calorie, then lean mass gets threatened, understandably. Yeah. And so, um, but the main takeaway from our review is that from a body composition perspective, intermittent fasting, at least in the general population, does just as good as daily caloric restriction. It doesn't do better than it. Yeah. A lot of people who love and are just religiously evangelical about fasting yes. would love to hear that it's better than daily caloric restriction, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we found was in terms of clinical markers, so mm -hmm. cardiovascular health, cardiometabolic health markers, the fasting variants, the intermittent fasting variants are no better than daily caloric restriction. And so um, there was a lot of hope and hype that was built around not just time-restricted feeding, early time restricted feeding yes. where you eat from like let's say 8 a.m to 4 p.m and then you suffer for the rest of the day you skip dinner right was there hope around that because it's more in line with the photo period yeah yeah okay it, it's it's uh, theoretically more in line with the uh circadian, circadian clock okay right? yep and so that was the hypothesis mm -hmm. but um just recently in a 12-month study by lou and colleagues he compared an 8 a.m to 8 p.m feeding model with an 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. feeding model. They um, compared effects on body composition and they compared effects on um, cardiometabolic uh, health markers. Mm -hmm. So things like blood lipids, blood glucose, um, insulin sensitivity, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the rainbow, <laughs> and it was a hypocaloric diet. Yeah. Okay? And, but it was a moderate hypocaloric diet where the men were on like 1,500-ish calories. So it was aggressive, but not... That, crazy, that's right? pretty low for men, though, no? Mm, it's sort of a standard thing to put overweight and obese people on in research settings. Okay, got it. So it wasn't one of these things where we're looking at below 1,000 calories. Yeah. So 1,500-ish calories. And so at the end of 12 months, uh, there were no differences between groups in terms of their weight loss, fat loss, and improvements in blood biomarkers of yeah. health. Yep. And so... You know, so much for the early time restricted feeding model, but it just speaks to the concept that human beings are highly flexible and resilient and they can thrive on such a wide range of protocols. Yeah. As long as by the end of the week, you're not eating too much. Yeah. It really is about calories and that's so wild. And you don't have to be obsessed with calories, but you have to know that you know, on a cellular level, when you're getting certain benefits, some cardiometabolic benefits, like having improvements in your cholesterol, your blood sugar, et cetera, it is coming down to energy intake, calories, and being in a caloric deficit, whatever way you got to get there.
whether it's the daily deficit or the intermittent fasting deficit that results in one kind of accidentally. That's right. That's right. And, and I have to also add that the leaner and more fit you get, the more that intermittent fasting variants can threaten the preservation of lean body mass. Yes. So there's actually a study that was done, I think it was Templeton, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but um, they looked at an alternate day fasting model on lean men and they compared it with daily caloric restriction. So the ADF model actually sacrificed some lean body mass compared to the daily caloric restriction model. But of course, the caveat there is, well, they didn't add resistance training and resistance training may have rescued some of those losses in lean body mass. That makes sense. Um, yeah. But uh, it, but wouldn't it be so much easier to just eat protein every meal yeah, <laughs> and maintain your muscle mass without extra resistance training? <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, you could do that, and then you could res resistance train and have the best of both worlds and yes. not have to say, okay, sorry, guys, I can't eat with you on, on Tuesday because I ain't eating on that day at all. Exactly. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, there's some interesting stuff and some interestingly anticlimactic findings with intermittent fasting, but we have to look at it this way. It's actually a, a major boon, a major benefit for practitioners who want to have a lot of tools in the toolbox yeah. to individualize programs. So knowing that the intermittent fasting variants are just as effective as daily caloric restriction and your muscles aren't necessarily going to fall off the bone doing yeah. intermittent fasting. Especially as as, if it's in the, the day, yeah, per day. yeah, Right, right. Especially if it's w within, let's say, a time-restricted feeding model. Yes. Then, hey, all the better for individualizing programs. Okay. So. Okay. So... Is there no marked benefit in terms of autophagy with intermittent fasting? Is that all? Mm, yes, just, yes. What is it? What's that word? <laughs> okay, so um, now I'm, I'm going to cover that. But one thing I forgot to mention was with women, there's some evidence that intermittent fasting disrupts the menstrual cycle in the sense that it prolongs menstruation. And so uh, by a couple of days. And that's not necessarily a a good thing that's not necessarily so it prolongs the luteal phase or the the menstruation phase the menstruation oh okay. yeah yeah and so that raises an eyebrow and it makes you go hmm maybe that's not the best thing for women to be doing and so there that there's not a whole huge literature yeah. on that yeah and we don't have a bunch of replication of trials showing that yeah women should kind of stay away from intermittent fasting yep yep but i'm gonna say women should be cautious of buying in and thinking it's just not going to affect yes the menstrual cycle could that be perhaps because we're more sensitive to stress hormones because we're meant to reproduce and our, our body's going to be sensitive to any sort of restriction of energy that would help our fertility? I would say you're dead on with that. Okay. Um, women's physiology is very sensitive to sensing an energy crisis because not only do you have to protect yourself, you have to protect the baby. Yep. And there's going to be a lot more robust physiological re revolt responses uh, yes. to physiological insults like energy unavailability. So, Could yeah. that stress or revolt response perhaps be a bit stronger in a woman who is already insulin resistant and is thus already experiencing some uh, blood sugar dysregulation and may be more sensitive to periods of time where there's no food intake and could have more of a blood sugar drop? I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibilities. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah just yeah. I'm I'm like trying to put some sort of like scientific basis to what I anecdotally experience. Where like for me, eating breakfast is so imperative, and I just know that if I skip breakfast, I can feel my heart is racing. I'm shaky for the rest of the day. I just don't feel normal for the whole day. Even if I eat at eleven or twelve, it really throws me off, um, stress hormone wise. And I've even measured on my CGM that. You know, if I don't eat breakfast, even if the first meal that I eat has that protein threshold that I need and I'm eating protein at every meal the rest of the day, I'm a bit more dysregulated versus if I have my first meal within 30 minutes, you know, upon waking and make it a protein forward meal. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of uh, anecdotal data yes. coming in like that. Yeah. And so at a certain point, you have to listen to it in the absence of replication of uh, controlled trials on the topic. You yeah, know? yeah. So autophagy that you asked about, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. that is just a buzzword that people just kind of latched onto and have just human nature. You know, it's it's an interesting concept. The word itself is kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it occurred, autophagy, uh, technically the, the, the 
self the, the cannibalization yeah. of cellular components um that that is a stress response and it is a catabolic process and it is something that i would consider to be a physiological algorithm that goes on in the background and that the body just self regulates according to what the overall picture of anabolism versus catabolism is in the body at the given moment and so whether you do an intermittent type of energy restriction or whether you do a linear energy daily energy restriction if you are a hypocaloric net then autophagy is going to go up okay that's just how it goes um, the other things that stimulate autophagy in various tissues is exercise mm. and so um, endurance exercise stimulates autophagy strength training resistance training stimulates autophagy and so um the problem with trying to chase autophagy through fasting is that it can be um anywhere from a zero sum game to kind of a losing proposition yep. depending on what's going on with your lean body mass because fasting is going to deprive you of not just energy but micronutrition yeah. and just nutrition period yeah and so there can be various downsides to that Whereas if you want to chase autophagy with exercise, hey, you're going to get your autophagy. Yeah. Okay. Which is kind of the wrong thing to chase in the beginning. Yes. Um, but you're going to get, you're going to ramp up autophagy, but you're also going to be um, strengthening the integrity of the musculoskeletal system. And you're going to be getting a win-win situation here. Got it. So that's why people latching onto the idea of autophagy okay that that in and of itself is questionable but then trying to chase it with energy deprivation that's even more questionable for our listeners who perhaps don't know what autophagy means would you mind clarifying exactly what that process is yeah it's um the body getting rid of damaged cellular components okay so abnormal cells perhaps because mm -hmm. we each of yeah. us have cells that become abnormal on a daily basis the way that people say oh we all have a certain amount of cancerous cells in our body at any given time that's essentially normal to have daily abnormal cells and autophagy is the process by which our body gets rid of those True. cells or that yeah waste. yeah autophagy self-eating that's Love that. that's really what the, the word stands for yeah i mean i just hear so many people in the keto world and the intermittent fasting world and the keto intermittent fasting world that are like this is the only way to increase your autophagy and autophagy is the most important thing in terms of preventing cancer etc so um now that we know that that's not the only way to promote autophagy and and you know perhaps prevent some sort of cancerous growths or cells from becoming more cancerous um is there a certain subset of the population that should be prioritizing and chasing autophagy not with fasting but with exercise and etc or should we all just kind of be trying it's, to get autophagy in every day <laughs> you know um increasing autophagy is just sort of like focusing on that is focusing on the wrong thing okay it's almost like focusing on keeping your glucagon up <laughs> <laughs> your body's you know gonna do I mean? it. yeah <laughs> yeah your your body is got control of of that physiological aspect of the whole symphony yeah and what you need to concentrate on are the more important things which is making sure your food selection is good making sure your overall intake is good making sure you're physically active and, and training properly and recovering and sleeping and managing your stress right. And making sure that you're building and protecting your muscle, That's really. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard this before on Dr. Lyon's episode and just my daily Instagram, but can you give us a little sound, sound bite on why muscle is so important, mm -hmm. not just for aesthetics, but for overall physical health and longevity? Okay, so um, muscle is where all of your incoming fuels are processed. So if you have very poor muscle quality and you're just untrained and you have low muscle mass, you simply won't be able to process those incoming fuels from foods and, and, and drinks. Yeah. Uh, you'll be able to process them, but um, to a subpar degree where your body struggles to uh, allocate those fuels to the right spots in the body and use them for the right processes. Mm -hmm. And so um, muscle is the metabolic furnace of the body. Uh, Dr. Gabrielle calls muscle the longevity organ, and yes, it is. Yeah. Um, it's under threat pretty heavily once people enter middle age. Yeah. Uh, people start losing muscle pretty rapidly at a certain point in the life cycle, typically at, uh, at the general population level. And so um, muscle is the 
it's it's metabolic central <laughs> yeah for the body and that's that's how important it is it preserves the integrity of the skeletal system yep. as well because you can't have good skeletal health without having good muscular health and they yes. work together and frankly you can't have good um cardiovascular health without the use of the muscles too what about cognitive health cognitive health as well absolutely yeah. neurological health yes Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think people don't think about cognition or even things like bone density, to your point, your skeletal system and how much muscle interfaces with that and how important it is to, mm -hmm. to have the muscle first and to put that resistance on the muscles so that our bones can be stronger, especially as we age. Yeah, there, muscle is the one thing, one of the few things that you can control to take command of your health and improve yeah. it. And I love that. All you got to do is just use it um, with the right progression and with the right maintenance, and then you have affected so many, like all of the other organ systems, yeah. by stimulating the muscular system. Yep. I love that so much because there's many things in this life that are out of our control. There's mm -hmm. many stressors and in daily life, you know, just life as a whole that we will never be able to control. But muscle is something that is within our control and that people can work on each and every day. And it's just like this gateway to health and we just don't give it enough um, importance. We just think of it as this aesthetic tool. We want to look good at the beach. So, okay, I'm going to go to the gym, but it's so much mm -hmm. more than that. Yep. So um, I also like that you mentioned that intermittent fasting, especially the alternate day uh, where you're going long periods of time, 24 hours or more without eating can actually compromise that muscle tissue. And mm -hmm. of course, we're spending so much time as individuals who understand the importance of muscle in terms of building that and maintaining it. So um, it's very important. And I wanna look at sort of the science of healthy fat loss, cause we already touched on finding your maintenance calories and going from there, controlling for protein, et cetera. But digging into that a little bit more um, in terms of how much protein, how much less than your maintenance calories one should be eating, um, how much protein is enough in terms of the RDA, if that's sufficient, as well as can too much protein be harmful? Mm. So let's just start with um, calories to begin with. How many, how many calories below maintenance should we be eating for healthy fat loss that also protects our muscle? Mm. And in that vein, how much protein should we be eating within those calories? Okay, so we have to start off with just simple heuristics and kind of put them to trial. And observationally, a deficit of 10 20% below what maintains you currently is a good starting point mm -hmm. for people who are normal weight and want to fine tune or people who are overweight and kind of want to get to normal weight. So when you're looking at cases of um, obesity and severe obesity, then you can look at deficits that are beyond 20% mm -hmm. below maintenance, like 20 to 30, sometimes 40% below maintenance, depending on the degree of obesity. Yeah. But you have those two tiers. You have 10 to 20% mm -hmm. for the people who are, you know, up to overweight to, you know, mildly obese. And then you have over 20%, like let's say 20 to 30, possibly 40% deficit for people with varying degrees of obesity. So that's sort of the spectrum you're looking at. But yep. I would tend to default just to 10 to 20%. There's nothing wrong yeah. with going the conservative route, putting it to trial for four weeks, seeing what happens. And if you made progress, great, keep it going. If you run into a plateau at some point, well, then you have the option to attack the plateau in any number of ways. I yeah. mean, there's several ways you can. Yeah. Okay. And so once you have calculated your maintenance calories through trial and error and you know where, what that is, and mm -hmm. then you reduce it by, let's say, 10% if you're being super conservative and yeah. want to go low and slow and you're in it for the long haul, and you see that you're losing pounds on the scale, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that the pounds that you're losing on the scale are fat versus mm -hmm. mostly muscle? Yeah, there's there's a quick and dirty way to do that. So if you maintain your lifting performance, mm -hmm. and I'm not just talking about your one rep maxes. Yeah. If, for example, you, on your favorite exercises for your very first work set, you can maintain the same amount of rep, maximal amount of reps that you can complete with, let's say, the first set, then that maintenance of lifting capacity is a good indicator that you are maintaining your muscle mass. Huh. So, yeah. And in a dietary sense, how much does protein play into that? Um, it is, I, I would say it's crucial. Um, people push back on the protein thing all the time because, you know, they don't want to bother with <laughs> the economics of eating that much protein. They don't want to bother with the pain in the butt of, you know, getting that protein ready. But um, with protein intake, 
again, you can look at it at, on, on two tiers. So the general population is who just wants to be healthy and just wants to be moderately, you know, moderately athletic at, at best. I mean, they don't necessarily have um, any extreme goals in yeah. the physical activity, the, the athletics, the aesthetics or the body composition department. They just want to be healthy. Yeah. Anywhere from 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight okay. is just fine. Okay. Is that in line with the RDA? <laughs> it's 50 to 100% above the RDA. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. That was a question I had for you. Is the RDA of protein enough? Is there any chance you can convert it to pounds for those of us who are oh, yeah, math yeah. challenged? Right, right. So about 0.5 to 0.7 grams per pound of body weight. That's the minimum that you're saying we should be getting to just be averagely healthy adults. Averagely healthy adults <laughs> in the general population. Okay. So that's if you're not yeah. training, if you're not focused on muscle health, you're not going to get into the gym. You just want to. You just want to. You just want to eat enough. Okay. You want to eat enough protein to minimize just negative health consequences down the line. Okay. And so that's just a very general. So 0.5 to 0.7 grams per pound. And, and that's people, well above the RDA. That is well above yeah. the RDA. Okay. Yes, absolutely. That's 50 to 100% above the RDA. And so um, what people That's... will typically ask from that point is like, well, gosh, um, isn't that too much protein if you assign that to somebody who is obese? Mm -hmm. Well, yes and no. Yes, it can be. Mm -hmm. And that's why with protein, uh, people try to push for assigning it according to lean body mass. Okay. But then you have the issue of presuming that you can actually figure out somebody's lean body mass. Mm -hmm. So a much more practical and simple way to do it is to base protein on somebody's target body weight or ideal body weight, as it's sometimes called. What do you mean? You don't have a DEXA scan in your living room? <laughs> <laughs> Not in my living room, no. Okay, all right. Just making sure. Um, so, so that's that one tier, the 1 1.2 to 1.6 1 or 0.5 to 0.7 grams per pound of target body weight. And just so you guys know, I just calculated it. If you're 125 pounds and that's your ideal body weight on the high end, that's like 88 grams of protein a day, which is a lot more than what the average person is eating if they're not being mindful of it. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people commonly eat like right around the RDA. Yeah. And some, some data shows that they eat above the RDA, but not much more. What is the RDA in pounds? The RDA in pounds is like 0.3-ish. Yeah. Whoa. 0.3 point, yeah. And why haven't yeah, they updated 4, this? 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. Um, they, it's because nobody cares enough. No one cares about nobody, muscle. <laughs> nobody at the, at the top of the government issued guidelines uh, pyramid, yeah. <laughs> um, they don't necessarily care enough. That's okay. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the second tier. The second tier. Okay. So the second tier is where you're looking at optimal protein intakes. And so in kilograms, that that's 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of target or ideal body weight. Yeah. And in imperial terms, that's 0.7 to 1.0 grams per pound of target body weight. Mm-hmm. And so that's where you really start getting into benefits that are both clinical and... um body compositional yeah and um also it benefits performance as well when and you say clinical benefits what do you mean so there there are studies um, actually done by donald layman um back in like early 2000s ish uh, late 90s where he compared the rda with double the rda on um, clinical parameters such as blood glucose um, blood lipids mm -hmm. and so there were better outcomes from the double the RDA group versus the RDA group. And is that solely because the protein is fueling the muscle? Or it's are there other benefits of protein? It's a combination of things. So uh, the protein was able to directly support uh, muscle and the rest of the lean body mass. Mm -hmm. And it was also able to increase the thermic effect of the diet mm. as well as the satiating effect of the diet. So all kinds of good things happen when you go from the RDA to double the RDA. Yep. And just so you guys know what thermic effect means, because it's something that I learned this year that I was fascinated by. Essentially, each macronutrient has a different thermic effect, which is really means the amount of energy that it takes for your body to digest that macronutrient. Mm -hmm. So fat has a pretty mild thermic effect. It's I think it's like three to five percent or one to five yeah, one to three ish one to three okay so it only yeah. takes one to three percent of the energy that you just consumed from fat for your body to digest it mm -hmm. when it comes to carbs is it like six to eight is is the typical yep 
the typical uh, range that's cited. And then with protein, it's like 20 to 30. Amazing. So you're burning 20 to 30 percent of the energy intake or calories from protein that you just ate simply because it was protein. Yeah. It's protein is energetically expensive to process within within the body. Yep. Which is a good thing from the standpoint of um, energy balance and people seeking to maximize energy expenditure and economize on energy intake with with that energy. You can eat more, but you're going to burn more of it. That's great. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So that second tier of, of protein intake is going to benefit people who want to optimize both their cardiometabolic health Mm -hmm. as well as their uh, body composition, especially in terms of preserving lean body mass Mm -hmm. and um, supporting athletic performance as well. And um, yeah, so that's that's the upper tier. Now, going beyond a gram per pound is typically beneficial for some fringe populations like physique competitors. Got it. So that's kind of where we see. And also there, there is... A little bit of crossover there into the extreme um, ultra endurance sports. Yeah. Where over a gram per pound, at least observationally, seems to be beneficial. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to be like a real bro and like lift really high <laughs> in the gym and compete, you got to go a little over a pound. <laughs> Arguably, yes. It, it, if you're hypocaloric. Yes. Okay. So this is another thing. Yeah. If you're in a caloric deficit, mm-hmm. It's even more important to up your protein because you are naturally in a catabolic state where you are breaking down tissue because you Mm -hmm. are not eating enough to maintain and sustain your tissue. You are actually losing body mass. Um, So you want to eat enough protein to protect it. That's right. And that's where you'd you'd be in that second tier, that 0.7 to 1.0 grams per kilogram of body weight if you're dieting. Uh, if you're not dieting, if you're just maintaining and you just you know want to stay sort of in the general population, general health, then um, that 0.5 to 0.7 is just fine. Yes. I'm glad that you said the word hypocaloric again, because when, when we were talking about autophagy before, I wanted to circle back to that and just close it by saying, you know, when you when you say that being in a hypocaloric state, that's promoting autophagy or increasing autophagy. And that's beneficial because it's cleaning up waste in the body. I was thinking, oh, no, what if I'm not in a hypocaloric state? What if I reach my body goals and I'm at maintenance? Am I sacrificing autophagy? But then you mentioned no matter what exercise is going to boost autophagy. So that's even right. if you're not hypocaloric, you've finished your fat loss phase, you're where you want to be. And now you're just maintaining and living life. Yeah. As long as you continue to exercise and resistance train, you're going to get the autophagy benefits of cleaning up waste and abnormal cells. That's right. And a lot of people who um, are pushing the caloric restriction, caloric restriction, hypocaloric, hypocaloric angle, they're forgetting that from middle age onward, especially 50 years and up, you begin your battle against frailty, yes. <laughs> especially 65 and up. You really start beginning your battle against frailty. Yep. And with people living into their 90s now, 30, 40 years is a long time to have a low quality of life. Oh my gosh, yeah. So we have to start looking ahead. Absolutely. You know? No, that's that's one of my biggest motivations too. It's like a lot of us have witnessed our elderly parents or grandparents really struggle with um, autonomy and mobility and you know, just being able to take care of themselves and do daily tasks because they simply don't have the muscle mass to support themselves. Um, mm-hmm. And because we lose so much muscle mass as we age and sarcopenia is a risk and there's all of these things. And so... Um, starting wherever you are right now, whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, even into your 80s, right? Like your sure. your mother and father-in-law, um, it matters because it's going to protect you from not being able to move and function when you're older. You want to yes. enjoy those years. That's right. It's important. That's right. And that's one of the other things I wanted to bring up with muscle. Immobility is the beginning of the end. Yeah. And so when you have function muscle you have mobility Mm -hmm. and you know the world is yours while you have mobility yeah yeah that's why we pick up heavy things in the gym that's right okay so we've covered we got our maintenance calories Mm -hmm. uh we're eating about 10 percent below those maintenance calories if we're trying to lose some fat and and recomp our bodies and even gain some muscle if you're a beginner you could very well lose some fat and gain some muscle at Mm -hmm. the same time if you're 10 to 20 depending on how aggressive you want to go yeah 10 to 20 yes Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're also going to make sure that within that caloric range that you now have, that 10 to 20% below maintenance, whatever that is for you, that you're ensuring that you're getting X grams of protein that are in line with your ideal body weight. Mm-hmm. So for me, let's say it's 125 grams of protein a day that I'm getting, and then I'll have leftover calories, right, within that range that I could use on either carbs or fat, That's because right. as you said, it doesn't matter if it's carbs or fat, That's you do right. what you want. If you prefer eating low carb, 
that's mm-hmm. great. If you prefer eating high carb, that's great. Just make sure that they match up for your calories. And can I say that with that piece, diet quality always matters. Yes. Like you don't want to get all your carbs from, let's say, like Coke or Kool-Aid or something. Okay. Oh, I was and... actually going to go do that. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to get all your fat from just you know, land animal fats and um, low quality fats within within processed foods. Yes. And so, um, yeah, that that's an important thing too. If you're going to go ketoing, you better... Pay attention, especially to the quality of your fat sources. Does this change with nuance, right? Um, does this, it doesn't matter if it's carbs or fat change when we think about someone who has insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes? Would there be a situation in those cases where there is a threshold of carbohydrates that we can tolerate and we should be aiming for a lower carbohydrate intake? Oh, that's such a good question because that applies to not just, um, let's say, pre diabetes and type 2 diabetics mm-hmm. specifically. But it also applies to muscle hypertrophy and athletic performance. Mm. So just talking about the the type 2 diabetes part, um, the literature converges on sort of this upper effective dose of 130 grams of carbohydrates a day that is beneficial for managing type 2 diabetes. Okay. And it's not this hard line, you know, set in stone number, but just statistically on average type 2 diabetics tend to do better with managing glycemic control when they consume 130 grams a day or or less now with ketogenic levels of carbohydrate intake 50 grams and below the general population just can't seem to maintain that for more than 3 to 6 months mm-hmm. so at the year at the the year point they're already consuming triple the originally assigned amount of carbohydrate yeah so 130 grams is a reasonable benchmark yeah. for type 2 diabetics yeah. to kind of kind of keep an eye on and see am i physically active enough to be able to accommodate more carbs than that yes does that threshold change as one improves their insulin sensitivity and loses mm-hmm. weight Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it, it totally does. So that threshold of 130 grams applies when you're actively d- dealing with type 2 diabetes. When you're actively dealing with it and uh, when you are, and just sort of at the general population level. Okay, okay. Yeah. So everybody, every type 2 diabetic has to get intimately acquainted with their carbohydrate tolerance. Yes. And so that 130 is kind of be shooting right in the middle. Some people will be able to n- not tolerate much more than below that, and some people will be able to tolerate more than that but you have to kind of find out Mm -hmm. what you can tolerate with that 130 being sort of the benchmark for the majority of type 2 diabetics um so so that would be sort of a nuanced threshold for that population Mm -hmm. so the other uh nuance there is if somebody wants to maximize muscle hypertrophy Mm -hmm. it's not going to happen on a ketogenic diet you can still gain muscle yeah. on a keto diet, and yeah, people do it all the time. You're gonna be struggling through that workout, but man. You're <laughs> you're limping along. You're dragging this ball and chain towards maximus, maximizing muscle hypertrophy if you're ketoing. So, got it. In the literature, observationally, the lower end of what would maximize muscle hypertrophy while still kind of economizing on carbon intake appears to be about three grams per kilogram of body weight okay. for carbohydrate intake. And so in pounds, that 